In this video, we're going to talk about the pathophysiology behind ectopic pregnancy. I've added timestamps regarding the epidemiology, risk factors, pathophysiology, and clinical presentation of ectopic pregnancy if you'd like to follow along. Ectopic pregnancy occurs when we have implantation of the blastocyst outside of the uterine cavity. Ectopic pregnancy makes up about 1.2 to 1.4% of all pregnancies, and in terms of where the blastocyst is going to implant, 95% of all ectopic pregnancies occur in the fallopian tubes, while the other 5% occur elsewhere. Of these 95% fallopian tube pregnancies, we can actually break down where the blastocyst may implant. First, we may see implantation into the fimbrae, which is going to make up 11% of all ectopic pregnancies occurring in the fallopian tube. The most common of fallopian tube ectopic pregnancies is ampullary implantation, and we're going to see 70% of all ectopic pregnancies occurring in the fallopian tubes implanting into the ampulla. Next, we can see implantation into the isthmus. About 12% of all fallopian tube pregnancies will have implantation into the isthmus. And finally, we can look at interstitial pregnancies, which are going to make up around 2-3% to of all ectopic pregnancies. Around 5% of ectopic pregnancies are not going to implant in the fallopian tubes, and instead are going to implant elsewhere. These locations include the cervix, previous cesarean section scars, or potentially the abdominal or peritoneal space. As we can see here, these types of ectopic pregnancies are considered rare, with cervical implantation occurring less than 1% of all ectopic pregnancies, and ligamentous or peritoneal or abdominal implantation occurring again in less than 1% of all pregnancies. In terms of development of ectopic pregnancy, a number of risk factors exist. These risk factors include pelvic inflammatory disease, and primarily chlamydia is going to be the most common factor leading to ectopic pregnancy, smoking, tubal surgery, history of infertility, and specifically a history of infertility with the use of assistive reproduction. This includes things like in vitro fertilization and use of drugs that are going to induce superovulation. If we take a look at our fallopian tube, we can specifically see how the pathophysiology of some of these diseases are going to lead to an increase in ectopic pregnancy. For example, as we draw here, something like chlamydia is going to lead to decreased size and increased inflammation of the fallopian tube. As a result, the blastocyst is going to have less room to move through the fallopian tube and into the uterus and increase the chances of implantation in somewhere like the ampulla. Although pelvic inflammatory disease was used in example here as something that can cause this decreased size and increase in inflammation, other factors such as smoking, tubal surgery, or tubal pathology can also lead to a decreased size of the fallopian tube or an increase in inflammation. An example of a tubal surgery that can increase the chance of ectopic pregnancy is a tubal ligation. Tubal ligation is often performed as a contraceptive surgery that aims to prevent sperm travel to the area of the fallopian tube where it's most likely to fertilize an egg, as well as to prevent egg traveling to the area of the fallopian tube where it's most likely to be fertilized by a sperm. However, in the rare chance that a sperm can bypass the tubal ligation, the egg can be fertilized, and because the blastocyst will be unlikely to pass the tubal ligation, implantation in the ampulla is much more likely. A number of tubal or ovum factors that may lead to increased chances of infertility can also increase the chances of ectopic pregnancy. Decreased motility of the ovum or the fallopian tube can increase the time in which the ovum spends within the distal parts of the fallopian tube, increasing the chances of ectopic pregnancy. Further, retrograde movement of the blastocyst or the ovum may move backwards through the fallopian tube, spending longer time there, or an egg or blastocyst that has traveled from the opposite fallopian tube may travel into the fallopian tube on the opposite side, leading to ectopic pregnancy. Finally, some assistive reproduction techniques are also correlated with higher chances of ectopic pregnancy. Things like drugs that induce superovulation can lead to an increased number of ovum in the fallopian tubes, increasing the chances of a blastocyst that forms implanting in the fallopian tube. Also, in vitro fertilization has been shown to increase chances of ectopic pregnancy. Finally, IUD insertion, a type of contraceptive device, can also increase the chances of ectopic pregnancy. We can now take a closer look at the fallopian tube in order to have a better idea of what's happening as our blastocyst is implanting into the fallopian tissues, specifically to the ampulla, as this is the most common site of blastocyst implantation in ectopic pregnancy. In order to have a better understanding of the negative effects of implantation, we'll take a closer look at the effect that the blastocyst will have on the wall of the fallopian tube. As implantation occurs, cytotrophal blasts will be released. As we know, those cytotrophal blasts play a role in remodeling the spiral arteries of the uterus in order to increase blood supply to the blastocyst. Because no endometrial arteries exist in this case, the cytotrophal blasts are actually going to begin remodeling of the epithelial vessels of the fallopian tube. Although we're specifically looking at the ampulla here, it's important to note that what comes next can occur in any area in which the blastocyst may implant an ectopic pregnancy. If remodeling is sufficient, an adequate amount of blood supply will reach the zygote or blastocyst, resulting in growth. However, if this remodeling is insufficient, the blastocyst or zygote will stop growing and die. 
In the case where remodeling is sufficient and we begin to see growth of the blastocyst, ectopic pregnancy can become a life-threatening situation. As we can see here, the blastocyst will begin to grow, putting pressure and strain on the external walls of the fallopian tube. This pressure will result in stretching of nerve fibers and will begin to present as pain in the pelvis or abdomen. The stretching and pressure becomes life-threatening when it begins to lead to destruction of the walls of the fallopian tube, increasing the chances of rupture and bleeding into the retroperitoneal space. Ectopic pregnancy is associated with a number of signs and symptoms. Of these signs and symptoms, lower abdominal pain and pelvic pain are some of the most common that present in patients with growing or ruptured ectopic pregnancy. As mentioned previously, this pain is associated with growth of the blastocyst or zygote, leading to stretching of the nerve fibers surrounding the walls of the fallopian tube. In these patients, the pain generally increases on palpation and may be referred to the same shoulder as the fallopian tube that's affected. Due to the stretching of the nerve fibers in the fallopian tube, these patients may present with autonomic symptoms such as nausea or diaphoresis. Third, vaginal bleeding or spotting is commonly seen in patients with an ectopic pregnancy. This bleeding will first occur as the blastocyst implants into the lining of the fallopian tube and may increase when we see rupture of the fallopian tube. If there is death of the blastocyst or zygote, the patient may also pass what's called a decidual cast. Fourth, these patients may present with unexplained hypotension, as the degree of vaginal bleeding does not necessarily relate to the severity of bleeding associated with rupture of an ectopic pregnancy. Patients may present with very little vaginal bleeding and symptoms such as hypotension, syncope, and orthostatic changes in blood pressure. A number of clinical tests exist in order to assist in diagnosing ectopic pregnancy. One of the most common is the measuring of beta-HCG levels. In normal pregnancy, beta-HCG levels should double over a 48-hour period. In patients with suspected ectopic pregnancy, failing of HCG levels to double usually indicates that ectopic pregnancy is present and exposes the likely inviability of the zygote. Secondly, transvaginal ultrasound is one of the most common ways to diagnose an ectopic pregnancy and has very high sensitivity and specificity. It's important to note that ectopic pregnancy should be considered a severe medical emergency. These patients are at high risk of hemorrhagic shock if the ectopic pregnancy goes unnoticed or spontaneously ruptures. The degree of vaginal bleeding should never be used to indicate the severity of ectopic pregnancy, and instead, all patients demonstrating the clinical signs and symptoms of ectopic pregnancy should be considered to be potentially having a medical emergency.